Okay, yeah, here it is. Uh, here is this uh, Ukraine war reaction. Uh, no, sorry, the deep. The, here is the Greek debt crisis uh, video. I guess my title hasn't been updated. A society and a state are two very different entities, even though some can confuse the two or see them as a necessity to each other. A society can exist outside of a state and be governed by the norms and customs which do not require any bureaucratic state's institutions of authority to enact or enforce. A state is a means to enforce a social contract upon a society, either with or without the consent of that society. Under Ottoman rule, Greece was a largely rural place, urban populations were small and the majority of Greeks lived in the countryside. Ottoman rule was capricious, the Ottomans enacted restrictive laws sometimes and neglected the entire province at other times. Large parts of rural Greece were left to themselves which resulted in the emergence of banditry and the general increasing distrust of the Ottoman institutions that did exist. Greeks started living by their own norms and customs and what developed in Greece is what is called a low trust society. A low trust society in general terms is a society that does not trust the state that governs over it. The distrust of the state results in parallel social institutions being established to replace the state and where the people organize their lives despite the state rather than through it. Greeks stopped paying taxes to Ottoman tax collectors as a common custom, both as an act of defiance and as a means of organizing themselves as a society. It is to this day a common practice in Greece and also in southern Italy for small businesses to keep two business ledgers if you own a business, one that you show to the tax collector and one with the correct numbers that is only shared with the family. The refusal to pay taxes out of defiance and distrust of the state is a curious Greek custom that continued even after independence when those taxes were meant for an independent Greek state. Low trust societies exist throughout many parts of Europe, created through religious abuse of power, fascism, organized crime, communism or as an imperial legacy. That many of them are found in the Mediterranean and are either Catholic or Orthodox is entirely in parts of Europe, created through religious abuse of power, fascism, organized crime, communism, or as an imperial legacy. That many of them are found in the Mediterranean and are either Catholic or Orthodox is entirely incidental. It is neither geography nor culture that shaped these social frameworks, but the decay of its institutions through specific historic events and developments. The relationship these European societies have with their state is more comparable to the relationship Colombian, Nigerian and Burmese societies have with their state rather than with German society whose relationship with the state has more in common with Japan and South Korea than Greece. Low trust societies, however, do not only distrust the state. To a degree, every society distrusts the state. What makes a low trust society unique is that the people tend to distrust each other. With the absence of the authority within a state as an arbiter and enforcer of law and order, low trust societies rely on their own norms to keep order. And these norms and customs are often built upon family groups and small kinship structures competing with each other. Norms can be bent or even breached, the only extent to which you can trust people outside of your immediate kin group is measured by how much they are indebted to you. Add in bandits or organized crime and you end up with a society in which nobody trusts anyone except their immediate family circles. Interestingly, a way this can be observed is through architecture. Throughout rural Greece you will find an architecture style of home building that is inward centered and socially defensive. Inner courtyards and walls that are meant to hide any potential wealth and business from the preying eyes of neighbors, while deliberately keeping the outside facade as modest as possible. You will find home architecture like this in many low trust societies in southern Italy, in Greece, in Nigeria or in Colombia. 
The result of this social structure in which nobody trusts their neighbor and everyone sees everyone as a competitor or potential rival is the development of a deeply entrenched clientelism in political matters and business. Business and political decision making is increasingly conducted on a favor based system. You get someone's support or loyalty only in exchange for informal handshake or through under the table backroom deal agreements. The Greek nation state that was born in the early 1800s had a weak state, a society that distrusted the state and a society in which nobody trusted anyone unless they were related or owed them something. One of the major causes of many of Greece's problems is not that you can't trust Greeks, it's that Greeks don't trust the Greek state and that Greeks don't trust Greeks. Greek independence is regarded by many historians to have been the first humanitarian intervention. The Greeks themselves would have never won independence without Russian, French or British support, who then placed the Bavarian prince on the throne of a newly constructed Greek monarchy. The hope was that those German aristocrats would build a functioning Eurocratic state. However, those Germans failed. The Greeks didn't trust their new German monarch either. The monarchs conceded to a constitution by 1844 and to universal male suffrage by 1864. What this means is that democracy arrived in modern Greece before a functioning and centralized state had been established. And through that, it was the customs and norms of the Greek low trust society that shaped modern Greek democracy. The 19th century Europe into which the newly independent Greece was born was essentially of an enormous social transformation for industrialization. The creation of large factories with enormous production output required the interconnection of cities with rivers and ports, as well as a new and enormous industrial workforce. The result was an enormous urbanization that took place throughout most of Northwestern Europe on a scale that dwarfs previous urbanizations. A transformation which the German sociologist Ferdinand Tönnies called the transformation from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft, translated from community to society. In a community, a people see themselves as part of a larger collective that they serve through their own efforts as participants in mutual benefit. In a society, people see themselves as individuals practicing in labor for their own direct benefit for others and themselves. You can observe that social transformation currently taking place in China, where up to 400 million people migrated into cities in the past 20 years, disrupting old Confucian rural communities and thereby strengthening the Chinese communist state, but also creating a new urban, individualistic, cosmopolitan Chinese citizenry that comes with new challenges to the Chinese communist state. However, back in the 19th century, this transformation did not take place in Greece and large parts of the Balkans. Instead, urbanization occurred through the the transfer of village populations into urban regions without industrial or political development, but as centers of public administration and commerce. Industry sectors did not really emerge until the 1930s. This resulted in rural customs and norms, as well as rural communities being preserved within a city. According to the Greek sociologist Apostolos Papakostas, what happened is that Greek cities transformed into becoming cities of... So this is interesting because it's the exact same thing that happened in Scandinavia as I talked about and watched in the video on Russia and Scandinavia that that the rural customs are often adopted in the cities rather than a shift towards individualism but in the case of the uh, but there was high trust rural areas in Scandinavia that had this happen, whereas in Greece, by contrast, it was low trust rural areas. So uh, I think that this is notable because it shows that sometimes something can be good and work in a good way for one culture or one situation, but then when you put in another one, it doesn't work that way. Because it's about valley... Cr valley crossing is essentially what's going on, rather than hill climbing. That is to say, oftentimes having... Oftentimes, in order to create a better society, you need to go through several worse society stages in order to reach it. This is uh, because every society, every prosperous society is prosperous in its own way. In other words, it's 
how do you get how do you get to Denmark, not how does one get to Denmark? Of peasants, and that the city Greek became a sort of urban peasant. You can observe a similar process in American cities where Italian and Greek immigrant communities formed such communities of urban villages until they recently started to dissolve and integrate into the wider American society. Greece, however, did at the time not have the strong enough state to dissolve the structures of these urban villages. Urbanization and modernization did not come with political development. What this meant for Greek democracy when it arrived in 1864 was that its voting blocks were not organized around social classes, but region and clan based. Political power in the new Greek democracy was therefore administered on a quid pro quo basis of clientelism, just as political power had before democracy. Greece consequently didn't develop an industrial proletariat or middle-class bourgeoisie. People did politics on the basis of their immediate community and kinship groups. You voted for someone in exchange for a favor once that person was in power. And what this favor ended up mostly being were public service jobs or regulatory exemptions. Starting in the 1870s, a system of patronage developed in Greece in which political power was established, gained and exercised through the deals involving handing out public sector jobs. The low trust society structure was thereby continued as Greece moved into the 20th century. And during the first half of that century, events transpired that lowered that trust even more. The most impactful and traumatizing of all would be the Nazi occupation of Greece. The Nazi occupation of Greece was extremely brutal. It is estimated that up to two thirds of the Greek population were active in the resistance. The Germans reacted to acts of resistance by picking a random town, murdering its entire population and burning that town to the ground, which would be the fate of 1,770 Greek villages. Over 100,000 Greeks were murdered and millions made homeless. The Nazi brutality, however, only fueled Greek resistance. Greece, to use a modern analogy, turned into a sort of Vietnam for the Nazis. And Greece consequently became one of the few countries that liberated itself from occupation during the Second World War. However, that occupation had severely eroded the already existing state structures and created no consensus on how to go forward. What followed was a brutal civil war between socialist and conservative political forces, which broke out before the Second World War had even ended and killed 50,000 people. With support by the British, the Conservatives won and re-established the Greek monarchy. Failing to appease large section of the Greek public, a move to democracy was promised, but stopped through a military coup that established a fascist dictatorship known as the rule of the free colonel. When we talk about fascism as historians or as a political structure, we often like to talk about the atrocities and crimes. This, of course, is an important aspect of it, if not the most important. But there's another aspect of fascism that we tend to ignore or that many don't even know about, even though it has one of the most devastating legacies for any society that is recovering from it. Institutional corruption. Fascist regimes tend to be some of the most crooked and corrupt. Fascist states from Chile to Argentina to Spain and everywhere else are almost universally steeped in extreme corruption and embezzlement. Through the abolition of systems of public accountability, no institutions remain to check the abuses of power that fascist rulers engage in. Consequently, they get away with misappropriating enormous funds and establishing clientistic economic structures. The and we very clearly see that with the United States. Uh, it seems... Yeah, I'm not... A, it seems like a lot of them... A lot of the Trump cronies even just revel in their corruption and uh, and brag about it because it's like, hey, uh, white Christians are doing this, so it's good. That is uh, not something that I I feel like I might be biased on my. Uh, on my understanding of this, but I think generally the generally Trumpists are proud of being corrupt. They're proud of being grifters. The process of competition among the private sector within a market economy is thereby replaced by a process of scheming for the favor of state officials by the private sector. A bribe here and a bribe there 
to gain favors and give favors. In Latin America, many dictators also grabbed national assets and divided them up among themselves. There's a reason why South American military dictators of the 1960s to 1980s are often referred to as Los Ladrones, meaning the thieves, because some of the richest men of South America never worked to gain their wealth. They just happened to be army officers during a military dictatorship and schemed during the military dictatorship to acquire national assets as their own. This was particularly widespread with devastating consequences in Chile under Pinochet. The main legacy in Greece that 20 years of monarchy and fascist dictatorship left was clientelism and corruption, institutionalized as the mode of operation within the state. The industrialists that emerged in the 1930s engaged in quid pro quo deals with the rulers and the dishing out of favors in exchange for deregulation and tax exemption. The result was that the by now common custom of refusing to pay taxes was strengthened, not just among smaller business owners, but made part and parcel of large business culture in Greece. The enormous shipbuilding and commercial shipping industries of Greece remained largely untaxed from the 1950s right up to the financial crash of 2008. But you cannot wag your finger at and blame the very wealthy alone. Take a look at satellite images of Athens and you will find one of the reasons why. You will notice an enormous amount of privately owned swimming pools in a lot of small private homes. Water is a valuable resource in Greece that cannot be wasted. Therefore, if you own a private swimming pool in Athens, you are supposed to register its existence with the city council to pay a special water tax. Now, with this image of hundreds of private pools you are seeing in mind, you should know that until 2008, there officially were only three private swimming pools registered in Athens. People simply didn't register them to avoid paying the tax. Now you can't blame it all on swimming pools alone, but this stands in general for how this custom of refusing to pay any tax was very widespread. On a larger scale, smaller businesses often didn't register any of their conducted business for taxation purposes. By some estimates, the Greek shadow economy made up between 30 to 40% of the Greek economy. Yes, that means that a third to almost half of a national economy was completely untaxed. Add to that that the large private sector industries had negotiated enormous tax exemptions and you have a recipe for disaster. However, the worst contributing factor is that this system of clientelism between the state and the private sector was continued after the return of democracy in 1974 by the emerging conservative political party, New Democracy. Conservative Greek political power was built on a preservation and continuation of a status quo that was beneficial for private business interests, but fiscally extremely irresponsible. The second major political party at the return of democracy was the Pan-Hellenic Socialist Movement, or PASOK. Rather than changing the status quo, its first 10 years in government were spent building another clientistic system, however revolving around the public sector. PASOK had a chance to reform the Greek state and get rid of the corruption that had festered deep into the state apparatus, but instead the Greek socialists sort of seized the means of corruption. Rather than dismantling the corrupt structures, they made them available to everyone. The main target of this were the national bank and the teaching sector, where appointments were increasingly no longer made on the basis of merit, but on the basis of clientelism. Vital national institutions, such as the national bank, which are essential for the functioning of any modern state, were undermined and used increasingly as political instruments of power. When the conservatives were re-elected, they did not try to abolish the system of political appointments, but instead kept the system and merely tried to outnumber the appointees loyal to the previous government with additional appointees loyal to themselves. The effect this had was not only that less qualified people ended up in state positions that require very high qualifications, but that these state institutions were increasingly ineffective in challenging power abuses and providing checks and balances or, well, to even just do for what they were created in the first place, their job. PASOK and ND traded power in elections five times. And all these changes in power began with political appointments in the institutions of the state and public sector. Up to 40% of public sector employees ended up having received their jobs through political appointments. The powerful public sector labor unions also guaranteed tenure for most such appointment jobs, meaning that rather than replacing them with a change in power, new governments just hired more to outnumber the previously appointed ones. 
This, as you can probably imagine, resulted in utter lunacy. An enduring mystery to this very day is just how many employees the Greek National Bank had before 2008. The number must be astronomical and completely nonsensical. This system established by the Greek socialists trickled down even into the lowest segments of the public sector. The city of Athens, for example, has 13 hospitals. Up until 2008, each one of these on average employed 30 gardeners to manage a public garden. But only one of these 13 hospitals actually has a public garden. The remaining 12 hospitals basically provided ghost jobs through public sector appointment. What's worse about this is that before the return of democracy, Greece had a very sufficient and strong community structure. Working people usually didn't have the benefits of corrupted states available to them. Because of this, the Greek working population became very self-reliant with strong work ethic. But through the state corruption now being made accessible to everyone by PASOK, it increasingly eroded the self-reliant community structures of Greece. Let's stop for a moment just to explain what a ghost job is. Basically, you made a deal with a politician who consequently owed you a favor and that politician registered you or one of your relatives as an employee of a public sector job like a gardener for a hospital that does not even have a garden. However, with a real wage and benefits for a job that isn't even real. A lot of Greeks basically started living in a parasitic relationship with their state. They paid no taxes, yet used the state to gain payouts and services. All of this was being paid for with excessive borrowing by consecutive governments, amassing an enormous national debt. Before 2008, Greece had a staggering 700,000 public employees, and after 2008, for every private sector job lost, two public sector jobs were lost. In short, Greek society had issues of trust with institutions of the state before they were even created. Then, politically, the Greek right created a broken and corrupted state and economy, and the Greek left then spread that corruption among the wider society. The failure to collect taxes, the clientistic business structure interwoven with the state, the overly bloated public sector and the enormous costs to the state combined to shape a recipe for a perfect and unavoidable disaster. A disaster that everyone in the Greek political establishment could see coming. But instead of instituting reforms to mitigate the damage, Greek governments decided to cover up the state of their finances until a foreign crisis blew the lid off. It is almost eerie how both the political right and left knew that an unavoidable disaster was coming, but neither did anything to stop it. Neither tried to call out the other for it, but they also didn't have some sort of secret agreement to pretend it wasn't happening. They curiously both just seemed to have silently agreed to lie to themselves each other and the wider country in many ways both parties on the greek political spectrum agreed to ride a dead gravy train into the abyss the amount of money the rest of europe spent after 2008 to bail out the indebted greek state lies at a quarter of a trillion euros or 300 billion dollars. Money Greece spent over 40 years on public sector ghost jobs, clientistic appointments and Olympic game white elephants. To put that into perspective, that is enough money to connect all European capitals and all European cities with a population of 300,000 and all European port cities, not just in the European Union but also in the Ukraine, the states of former Yugoslavia, the United Kingdom, Albania, Turkey, Belarus, Switzerland and Western Russia with modern high-speed rail lines. Seven times. The burden of this excessive spending has now been dumped upon the millennial generation of Greece, with the country being placed under strict condition by creditors to produce a budget surplus until 2060. In many ways, this is the biggest tragedy of this story. Generations of Greeks who are not yet even born will pay the price for the excesses of the Greek baby boomer generation. When I asked a Greek friend how average Greeks in their political culture allowed for this to happen, the answer he gave was Your average Greek is a socialist when he needs public services, a communist when he is fired, a liberal artist when he wants to impress a woman, a libertarian when he has to pay taxes, a nationalist when he talks about Turks, a fascist when Pakistani migrants move into his neighborhood, and a conservative when his daughter starts dating. What I see reflected here is that Greek politics developed out of clientelism as a means to use the state and politics not for public reform or service, but for your own personal means and benefit through backroom deals and appointments at the cost of everyone else. 
After 2008, there was a lot of talk about how Mediterranean culture and work ethics supposedly caused this mess. This, however, is wrong. It ignores that Spain had a well-balanced budget and that the cause of its financial troubles can be found in the irresponsible actions of private sector Spanish banks. Or that Ireland isn't even a Mediterranean country. Greeks, statistically, also on average work more than Germans. Prominent American economists called it the crisis of the welfare state. This is also untrue. It ignores the fact that European states with large social spending structures weathered the crisis better than the United States did. And it also conveniently ignores that it was the Americans and their private sector excesses that blew the lid off the crisis in the first place. Now, the reasons for why the debt crisis happened is different in each affected country. And in Greece, the reason is a legacy of a low trust society that built a weak state institution that was not impartial and vulnerable to clientelism. The challenge that Greeks now face today is to build a modern, impartial, publicly accountable and meritocratic institutions of a state from which a high trust society can evolve. The story of these events and developments that led to the Greek debt crisis of 2008 is ultimately a great example for one thing. In previous videos, we have seen with Russia how corruption can be used within institutions of a state to strengthen an authoritarian system. Greece, however, is a great example. of a state. In the next video, we will go to medieval Hungary to talk about oligarchies as a political structure, to explain why they are self-destructive and I found this video good, although I feel like I have a little less commentary on it than some other videos. I'm going to... Uh, Come back in a few minutes. Just got to uh, got to fix up the title and stuff for uh, my next reaction.